diligence, used 15 times in 14 verses of the Bible. Diligence is making it well with my soul and mind so that it brings righteous joy and gladness to my being. has left the building. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. That reference is a reference to Ezekiel. And this is Quick Study on radio and television. And we're going through the Bible in one year. Today we focus on Ezekiel chapter 10 to 12, where he sees the glory of God depart. And so today we look at the subject, God has left the building, which begs the question, why? Why did God remove his glory? So we'll be talking about that and more coming up in just a moment. Corey is also here with Bible Archaeology and History. Corey? Yeah, well, we are actually going to be taking a look at, in Ezekiel chapter 11, when God's glory does depart from the temple, we're looking at where it ends up. So we're going to be taking a look at that in a little bit. Excellent. We'll have points for you how this affects our lives today. It's going to be good. Here's Ryan with Cosmic Mysteries. Today, we're going to be talking about the coming four blood moons. You're not going to want to miss this one. I hope you stick around. That's interesting. Uh, we've got some, received a lot of attention by Pastor John Hagee lately. All right, so what is the do you know? Well, do you know in Ezekiel's description of the cherubim, how many faces did they each have? Fascinating question. This and more coming up, but here first is Corey. <laughs> chapter 11, there's this very disturbing account where Ezekiel has been transported um, spiritually to Jerusalem and the temple. And what he sees recorded in Ezekiel chapter 11 is the glory of God moving from the temple. And it actually moves away from the temple, it says, to the mountain east of Jerusalem. And of course, that mountain east of Jerusalem is the Mount of Olives. So right now, you and I are going to explore the history of the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is a mountain ridge just east of the city of Jerusalem. As an important protective feature and lookout point for the capital city of Israel, the Mount of Olives has appeared in several important moments recorded within the Bible. The first mention is with no surprise connected to the king who founded Jerusalem, King David. It is a mournful account from 2 Samuel 15. David's son had launched a rebellion. And to save his life, King David walked out of Jerusalem with his court, weeping and lamenting as he climbed the Mount of Olives to lead the city. It is interesting to note here that the claimed Messiah of the New Testament, Jesus, a descendant of King David, entered Jerusalem before the Passover, coming back from the way David exited. Jesus rode on a donkey as prophesied in Zechariah 9, down the Mount of Olives and into Jerusalem, while people shouted praises from Psalm 118. During this last Passover of Jesus' life, the New Testament documents that Jesus would spend his days teaching in the temple complex and his nights outside of the city on the Mount of Olives. When paired with a prophecy from the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, this detail becomes intriguing. In Ezekiel 11, verse 22 and 23, the glory of God is seen to leave the temple complex and rest on the Mount of Olives. The New Testament also details Jesus' teaching on the future that he gave on the Mount of Olives, and it names the Mount of Olives as the place of Jesus' ascension into heaven. 
According to the Old Testament prophet Zechariah, in the last days, God will descend upon the Mount of Olives and use it in a very intriguing way. It's time to study the wise guys of the Bible. And our reading assignment today is Exodus, or excuse me, Ezekiel chapter 10 through 12. Now listen to this. This Jewish exiled priest called Ezekiel was a wise guy in his unwise generation. The man frequently is called the son of dust in some translations, and it was made wise. He was made wise by the visions that he witnessed from the spiritual side of earthly reality in which he lived. You see, wise guys know and realize that there is more going on in any conflict, whether it is political, whether it's an election, social movement, spiritual renewal, there's more going on than earthly manifestations. So Ezekiel sees the glory of God depart from the temple, the temple of God in Jerusalem, leaving the building exposed. What does this mean? Well, let's study on and get wise by exploring Ezekiel, the wise guy of the Bible. Ezekiel 10, 1 through 9. And I looked, and there in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubim, there appeared something like a sapphire stone, having the appearance of the likeness of a throne. Then he spoke to the man clothed with linen and said, Go in among the wheels under the cherub, fill your hands with coals of fire from among the cherubim, and scatter them over the city. And he went in as I watched. Now the cherubim were standing on the south side of the temple when the man went in, and the cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and paused over the threshold of the temple. And the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. And the sound of the wings of the cherubim was heard even in the outer court, like the voice of Almighty God when he speaks. Then it happened, when he commanded the man clothed in linen, saying, Take fire from among the wheels, from among the cherubim, that he went in and stood beside the wheels. And the cherub stretched out his hand from among the cherubim to the fire that was among the cherubim, and took some of it, and put it into the hands of the man clothed with linen, who took it and went out. The cherubim appeared to have the form of a man's hand under their wings. And when I looked, there were four wheels by the cherubim, one wheel by one cherub, and another wheel by each other cherub. The wheels appeared to have the color of a barrel stone. Ezekiel chapter 10, verses 1 through 9. This is Quick Study. My name is Rod Hembry, and we are studying the exiled priest prophet Ezekiel from the 5th century. He is seeing visions of God. And the vision we're going to look at today is called the departure of the glory of God from the temple. It is an amazing and stunning scene which actually took place before the Great Fall in 588 BC. Janice has read the scripture. Time is short today, so we need to focus on the scripture and get to our wisdom points. Here, beloved, is Ezekiel chapter 10, beginning with verse 1. And the great prophet said, And I looked, and there in the firmament that was above my head of the cherubim, there appeared something like a sapphire stone, having the appearance of the likeness of a throne. And then he spoke to the man clothed with linen, and he said, Go in among the wheels and under the cherub and fill your hands with the coals of fire among the cherubim and scatter them over the city. And he went in as I watched. Now, let me explain what is happening. 
What is happening is God is showing Ezekiel the difficulty and the problems and the absolute abandonment of the worship of God in the temple of God. He's showing the abominations here. And so God is showing him what's happening. The judgment of God is coming, and a very big part of that judgment is the removal of God's presence and the decommissioning of God's holy of holies. What an amazing thing to see. Now let me explain. You see, God leaves a generation who has rejected him and his word to the vices of Satan's realm. When we reject God as people, when we force God out of our lives, we say, God, we don't want you here. We don't want you in our schools. We don't want you in our life. We don't even want any remnant of your word on any of our public buildings. We want nothing to do with you. We want to make our state completely abandoned of any divine being. Uh, that is a statement of two things. Number one, it's the statement of then the nation itself becomes a God unto itself. And number two, which is like Rome did, worship the emperor. And number two, God pulls back and he says, okay, then you're on your own. You want to be a God of yourself, then you protect yourself. And that nation or that state or that city or that family or that whatever it is, country, falls under the vice and falls victim to any demon that roams the earth. It is a sad, sad time. And so in chapter 10, beginning with verse 3, the Bible says, Now the cherubim were standing at the south side of the temple when the man went in and the cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherubim and paused over the threshold of the temple. It just paused there. It's an amazing thing. And the house of the Lord was filled with the cloud and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. And the sound of the wings of the cherubim was heard even in the outer court like the voices of the Almighty God when he speaks. What an amazing thing. The, the presence of God, the glory of God actually created a physical sound. It actually was so strong that it spilled over into the physical. Now, beloved, that reminds us of something, a wisdom point. God leaves a church or an assembly who has turned against God's word. His presence is not with those who willfully resist his voice. Beloved, we cannot reconcile God to our ideas. We must reconcile our ideas to God's word. Whenever we try to reconcile God to think like we think, trouble is in the air with a capital T that rhymes with P, which means plunder. Now, Ezekiel chapter 10, verse six. Then it happened when he commanded the man clothed in linen, saying, take fire from among the wheels and from among the cherubim, that he went in and he stood beside the wheels. And the cherubim stretched out his hand from among the cherubim to the fire that was among the cherubim. And he took some of it and he put it into the hands of the man who was clothed in linen who took it and went out and the cherubim appeared to have the form of a man's hand under his wings. And when I looked, there were four wheels by the cherubim, one wheel by one cherub and another wheel by another cherub. And the wheels appeared to have the color of barrel stone. Now what's going to happen from this point on is the glory of the Lord is going to move away from the temple and depart. God is decommissioning the temple at this time in the fifth century. Beloved, God leaves all of our social and humanitarian projects when they are done in the name of the human spirit instead of the name of Christ. You can be feeding a billion people a day, but if you're doing it in the name of the human spirit, you're mimicking Christ, but you're not doing it in his name. You're not doing it for Christ. A pure altar always puts God front and center, and the worship is aimed at God, not at the compassion of man. Now, Ezekiel, of course, writing the book of Ezekiel was a prophet of God, a priest called to be a prophet of God. Now, one of the main things that was going on in the southern nation of Judah is that there were a lot of false prophets that had risen up. The historical records of Israel's kings give an overview of how many prophets or seers were functioning during the days of the monarchy. 
Many readers are surprised at the source references in Chronicles that list books recording events and reigns of the kings written by prophets. In the days of King David, there are two prominent prophets. The first is Nathan, who confronted David on a few occasions and wrote a history entitled The Events of Nathan the Prophet. The second is Gad the Seer, who is also credited with writing a book about David's reign. The lifetimes of Rehoboam, David's grandson who split the nation, and Jeroboam, who was chosen to rule the north, were heavily influenced by prophets. Edo, the seer, wrote his visions and their history. There are two unnamed prophets in 1 Kings 13. Shemaiah the prophet warns Rehoboam about invasions, and Ahijah the Shilonite also prophesied and wrote. Throughout the remaining king's reigns appear prophets like Azariah, the son of Oded, Hanani the seer, Hanani's son, Jehu, Micaiah, son of Imla, Eleazar, son of Dadavanhu, famous Elijah and Elisha, along with 100 unnamed prophets saved from Jezebel, and Oded the prophet, who saved Judah from enslavement by Israel. There are prophets whose whole books are in the Bible. Jonah, Zephaniah, and Amos prophesied during the days of Jeroboam II of Israel and Uzziah of Judah, along with Isaiah and Hosea. After their time came Micah, then Nahum. The prophet Jeremiah ministered around the time of the destruction of Judah by Babylon, followed closely by Habakkuk. These books accurately represent history and give examples of what the lost book of the prophets probably looked like. Remember, Quick Study Television is available on iPhones and all Android portable devices. For more information, go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and click on Mobile TV Device. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. Ephesians 6 verse 12, the Bible. According to the Bible, when we wrestle against the economy, political leaders, moral decline of our nations, conflicts in marriage and family, there are spiritual roots to it that need to be overcome. This month, when you support Quick Study for a gift of $25 or more, we will send you two very important teachings on spiritual war by Rod Hembry. This unique video series is called Spiritual War and How to Win. The first teaching is the truth of spiritual war for men, and the second is authority in the spirit for Bible believers. It is a culmination of years of biblical research and experience learned by watching God's people overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit. For your copy, write to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. Pastor John Hagee's drawn a lot of attention to the so-called blood moons, but these blood moons are predicted by NASA. What is all this about? Here to help us understand is Ryan Hembry. In our very interesting study today, we're going to be looking at the coming four blood moons, which NASA has confirmed will happen. How should we interpret this incredible phenomenon? Let's study on. According to NASA, there are going to be four red moons with an eclipsing sun between the dates of April 2014 and October 2015. Interestingly, these same four red moons and solar eclipse has already happened three times. The first time this occurred was in 1492, the second in 1948, and the third in 1967. What is the significance of these dates? April 1492 was the Edict of Expulsion when the Jews were forced out of Spain under the leadership of King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. Due to their unwillingness to convert to Catholicism, the Jews were given 14 days to get out of Spain or they would be killed and their property seized by the Roman Church. The second time these red moons occurred was in 1948. This was the year that Israel was reborn after the Holocaust. The third time the red moons occurred was in 1967. In this year, on Yom Kippur, Israel was attacked by six Arab nations. 
This six-day war was nothing short of a miracle. Israel had victory after victory with no military reason. In addition, this was the year that the city of Jerusalem and Israel were reunited for the first time in 2,000 years. These three occurrences of the Red Moons, although not reported in the media, have been confirmed by NASA. But what do all these dates have in common? They all center around the Jews, and they all begin with sorrow and end in triumph. How then should we interpret these cosmic signs, and what can we expect for the coming four Red Moons? What does this all mean? The Bible gives us an extraordinary interpretation of these signs. In the prophecy of Joel, God, who is the God of Israel, is recorded as saying, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Interestingly, Peter seconds this statement in Acts chapter 2. Could it be that God has been sending the world messages using the heavens all this time? According to the Bible, the Jews are God's chosen people, and intriguingly, the coming red moons, or blood moons as a biblical interpretation renders them, will fall on very significant Jewish dates. NASA confirms the following dates. April 15, 2014, a blood moon will occur. That is Jewish Passover. Then on October 8, 2014, a second blood moon will occur. This day is Sukkot. On March 20, 2015, a solar eclipse will occur. On this day, long ago, Israel was released from Egypt's bondage. On April 4, 2015, a blood moon will occur. This is also a Jewish Passover. And on September 28, 2015, a final blood moon will occur. This day is Sukkot. While these cosmic events will not be able to be seen everywhere, they will be seen collectively around the world. The question is, what events are going to occur on these coming blood moons? Jesus said in Luke 21, And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Whether these coming four blood moons is the final signal before Christ returns, we cannot be certain. However, we can be confident that something big is going to happen with regard to the Jewish people. Now next Friday we'll be continuing our study of the four blood moons, but in the meantime, if you'd like to research this more for yourself, I recommend Pastor John Hagee's video on YouTube. Now you need to type in John Hagee, the coming four blood moons. Then look for the video that's two hours long. You know, it's very interesting because the Bible, the whole the key to this thing, Ryan, is that the Bible itself says that God has placed the sun and the moon and the stars in the sky to mark times and seasons. Mm -hmm. Genesis 1.14. Exactly, Genesis 1.14. And so, now let's get this straight. We are not, we're not making any predictions here about the coming of Christ or the rapture, right? That's right, no, we're not making any predictions. We are observing what Ezekiel says and we're observing what is observable really by anyone. So it's very, very important. We're gonna, this is gonna be an inter interesting study. Wait till you see next week. I've reviewed the piece, it's very, very good. So make sure you're around next week. Uh, we have Do You Know? Mm -hmm. Do You Know in Ezekiel's description of the cherubim and we're reading Ezekiel chapters 10 through 12 today. How many faces did they each have? Okay, so these are the cherubim mm -hmm. that are around the throne, and how many faces did they have? What do you think, Corey? I believe that they had four faces, and I'm pretty sure I know what those faces were, but I'll go with four. I'll go with four. Do you want to try to name the faces? Okay, sure. Um, the face of a man, the face of an eagle, the face of a lion, and the face of a cherub or a bull, depending on your English translation. All right, so there she goes. What She's do you think? Right. She's absolutely right. She's yep. really smart. That would be Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 14, describes the cherubim. Now, I don't know how much time we have uh, left. Carry on. I was just going to say, are there any other features unique to the cherubim that you all can remember? Mm -hmm. well, they mm -hmm. got, so they, well, yeah, they, they've got these wings. Uh -huh. that are, how many? Well, there's six, four. isn't there? No. Four. Four. Are there four Seraphim wings? have six. That's oh, that's right. right. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of the uh -huh. seraphim yeah. rather than the cherubim. Uh -huh. And there All was right. something that Ezekiel could see under the wings, under two of the wings. Anybody yes. know what that would be? Yes. What was that, Corey? Arms. They looked like human arms. Had the appearance of human arms. Of human hands. That's right. Yep. Again, these are different angels than the seraphim. That's right. All right. So um, carry on. Uh, they don't turn corners, right? They just go in one direction. They, they don't turn aside. They follow their head. Uh, let's see, their whole body with their back, their hands, their wings, and their wheels were full of? 
eyes. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing we need to mention here is that you, you mentioned, just kind of went by it. I want to come back to it. The Bible is explicit in telling them that, telling us that when these angels move, what appears to be a physical movement, mm -hmm. they don't, they don't sway and act as if they're confined to the laws of this universe. So there's no gravity pitch or, or give and take here. It is, com they are completely independent uh, and not under the laws of the physical universe. Yet they are physical. And so this is a very important feature of the supernatural world and the throne of God in heaven. Attitudes of Christ, like the gifts of the Spirit, can be mimicked, but only for short bursts of time. The power of God in any work or action will come only when we do it in the name of Christ with a heart submitted to Him. God's wisdom is at work in us when we realize that the Lord's work is done through the authority of God's power and His Word. Any other action or reaction is temporary, an act of the human spirit. All genuine healing power comes exclusively from Jesus Christ. So with that we pray, Lord, I will do good to this world in your name so that my works will glorify the Father in heaven and not myself. In our Wise Up segment today, we study the book of Proverbs. We just entered a new chapter, Proverbs chapter 19, verse one. Now listen to this. Better is the poor man who walks in his integrity than one who is perverse in his lip and is a fool. Wow, that kind of puts a new value system on things, doesn't it? It means that the most important thing is not how much money you have or how cute or how smart or how you can make people laugh, but your integrity, saying what you do and doing what you say. And may I say, beloved, the only way to truly have integrity and to have that, that self-control and that discipline is through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the only way to have that power is to give yourself to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. He will give you the deposit of the Holy Spirit. He will immerse you in His power. Come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I need some self-control right now, and I believe you died on the cross and rose again to give me a new chance. So here I am. I'm yours. Quick Study is brought to you by the faithful listeners and viewers of this program. We need your help to continue. Would you consider helping us? You can give online at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. That's BibleDiscoveryTV.com.